welcome to risk roundup is human intelligence still the most meaningful form of intelligence that can be effective in managing complex industry risk as the digital global age grow in scale and complexity there is an increasing concern that manual business practices manual business processes that are driven largely by human intelligence are no longer sufficient to effectively perform complex industry tasks on its own in a timely and cost effective manner nor are they effective in managing complex interconnected and interdependent industry risk from across nations there are numerous reports emerging that machine learning has convincingly penetrated complex business processes across many industries from credit lending to credit scoring and robot control to remote sensing thousands of machine learning applications have already been getting deeply embedded across complex business processes these are just some examples as we take a step forward in our digital global age journey entities across nations its government industries organizations and academia in short referred to as ngioa will surely need to go beyond basic tasks and processes like computing data and collecting metrics to developing more intelligent algorithms to strengthen some of the most important interconnected and interdependent operational tactical and strategic technologies processes and initiatives independently and collectively this will likely impact and change not only technology and processes but also business management and governance models intelligent machines are here and the question is whether we the individuals and entities across ngioa are prepared for what is to come so what does all this mean it means that if the decision makers across ngioa are not thinking about machine learning deep learning and intelligent machines now then they run the risk of their initiatives products services and businesses being undoubtedly disrupted in the coming years to discuss this further i'm delighted to welcome pedro fonseca pedro is the ceo and head of data science and crowd process and have had th this company and uh, pedro they have developed developed an amazing product called james welcome pedro we are delighted to have you on risk roundup hi thanks for having us wonderful pedro so while credit scoring models that are based on classical statistical theories have been widely used across nations for so many years and decades i would say it seems machine learning is now being explored for credit so credit scoring what is the reason behind this new approach why there is a need mm -hmm. well there are a couple of uh, needs i think one of the key ones was the the entrance of uh, many new players into an industry which isn't growing particularly fast so credit uh, used to be a really fast growing industry where you didn't have to be particularly competitive on the risk side you could just be okay and it would still be extremely lucrative and now it's becoming increasingly polarized so you end up having the really advanced uh, larger uh, banks with the with the best risk teams and the best uh, teams in, in general being able to outperform everyone by a lot. And on the other side, you see new players such as lending platforms coming along and taking up a large slice of the cake as well. And that leaves the vast majority of uh, banking and of banks and lending organizations stuck in the middle. They don't have the low cost of capital of the top tiers and they don't have the really advanced systems for avoiding non-performing loans as, as the lending platforms have. And that created an arms race, effectively, because if you have, if all of your competitors have really good risk systems, then you're left with everything else, and that's really not where you want to be as a lender. Yes, yes, but the underlying problem it seems is that while credit scoring models that were based on classical statistical theories, they had been widely used across nations for so many years. These models are less resilient when it comes to large amounts of data input, and with the digital global age. This is a complex challenge because there is so much data that is being generated and that needs to be identified and evaluated to make some sense of this. So I think that's where this machine learning is has become a necessity because we need some you know process that can collect the large amounts of data that is being generated you know and that has so many 
uh, interconnectedness and interdependencies that is coming with it that requires something that is beyond human intelligence because uh, machine learning influences the accuracy of prediction and of model generalization so that is very much necessary for industries that needs to identify and evaluate large amounts of data in a timely manner in a short amount of time because it's not that human intelligence will not be able to uh, manage these complex uh, risks that are rising because of the digital global age but that it, it would require so much time to analyze that data and there it's not practical or feasible to analyze that much data in a uh, time that we need for taking the accurate decisions so that's what i think you know this machine learning is uh, uh, proving to be very act, uh, useful and it uh, seems that there are many initiatives on machine learning application for credit risk space and even in united states i see so many organizations that are working in that direction can you explain yeah. the approach that they are taking for risk modeling here so firstly the i think one of the things that we found in general is that credit scoring is five to ten years behind all of the other industries so the approaches that we're starting to bring into credit scoring uh, are approaches that were being used in marketing to build recommendation engines in 2006. This is not particularly new. However, mainly, mainly because risk by definition is more conservative, the transition, and because the regulation level is higher, the transition was slower. So specifically the US. The US started by having, um, well, effectively human classifiers looking at loans and figuring out, I have a, I have a gut feeling that this might be a good loan or a bad loan. You know, then obviously as time progressed, it moved to statistical models. So everyone started using either logistic regressions or using FICO scores or other type of scores, which are effectively glorified logistic regressions. Uh, and then um, slowly uh, banks such as Capital One started experimenting with more advanced things. So quite famously, you can find research pieces by some banks that show, okay, these are things that we used for detecting fraud and we used random forests and gradient boosting classifiers and then neural networks and we detected fraud in this space. And then very slowly in the credit risk side, okay, if we can detect fraud and transactions using these algorithms, maybe we can detect our own defaults using the same type of algorithms. And slowly they started to make this transition as well. Uh, once they started making this transition, they found that it is not that simple. First of all, the banks themselves don't have the kind of teams that allow them to use this kind of thing and to be able to explain a result. So they started getting in trouble with CFPBs, FCCs, etc., who have legitimate concerns when a bank is using something that they can't quite understand. They, it is the role of the regulator to make sure that everyone can, yes. can understand it. So what we found was that there is a, an adoption problem in the US, in Europe, uh, of these machine learning techniques that already are, are out there in existence. So what the main challenges that I have as a bank is I want to, one, build up a team that can use all of this and I don't need to worry about only having one person who understands what's going on and if that person gets hired by my competitor, I'm done for. And then I need to make sure that when I build a model, I can actually sell it internally to my internal stakeholders, to my board, that people won't say, okay, that just looks like black magic. I, if I can't understand what's coming out from there, I don't want it used. used. And thirdly, um, to be able to explain it to the regulator and to make sure that you, know, you haven't produced a, a racist algorithm by accident, which if you're not careful, a machine learning algorithm can very easily damage someone by the actions of their peers. So the challenge is really with adoption, and that's where we came in and where we're playing with James, is making sure that a, the adoption process is seamless and that the bank can go from having either a dependency on FICO or a model which is quite basic and linear to being able to use more advanced models and to get them approved and into production. I see, I see. So this James platform that you have built, that is useful to who? To risk officers or what is it used for? Mm -hmm. So it's used by uh, risk officers uh, to get machine learning models into production in credit risk. So if you have a, let's say, consumer loan portfolio or a small and medium enterprise loan portfolio and you want to predict probabilities of default, it is likely that you have a relatively linear model that you have built or a scorecard-based model 
and you know that you have uh, your own accuracy or more specifically your own uh, Gini coefficient on how well you can predict lo good loans and bad loans. However, once you start trying to improve on that uh, Gini, uh, you start running into trouble with uh, either being able to explain it or being able to deploy it because suddenly it's not as trivial. And what we found was that ourselves as consultants, we could do a lot of work helping the banks, but we were only being able to help them one by one. So that's why we created James, which is a narrow artificial intelligence that helps with the adoption of machine learning. It doesn't, and I'm sure we're going to go into this in more detail, but it doesn't actually replace the risk officer in the sense that the risk officer is essential, but it enables him or her to build better models. I see, I see, I understand that. Now, so how, the one that you have developed, the James uh, platform, as well as the others that are out there, how effective are they, uh, are the, these credit risk models that are being built by organizations like yours and others uh, for the machine learning approach initiative and how effective are they in doing what they are supposed to do? Mm -hmm. So the, the short answer is that they're almost scary, scary in terms of how much better they are to the traditional models. And this is not even because our technology is some sort of black magic. It, it's, it's not. It's just well-tried and tested uh, algorithms. Um, it is simply the case of being able to reduce the number of assumptions that need to be made on the data, reduce the number of biases that we need to keep, and effectively go and make the best prediction that is possible. Another big advantage is in terms of uh, robustness. So if you have a model that is um, quite linear, often it will work well as long as the market doesn't change. And, you know, this is the real world, markets change. So being able to build models that are robust is also a big challenge where machine learning can help a lot way beyond the linear model. Um, specifically in terms of numbers, I think it was uh, Lloyd's that found that you could get a 12% reduction in non-performing loans by just by switching from model, one model to the other as long as you could then figure out a way to get the whole approval process to work well and the adoption process to work well, which is why us as a company decided to focus on that word adoption rather than the word performance, because the performance is a property of the algorithms and of the people who are in the bank. And generally, the people who are in the bank are, are, are imaginative enough to, when they enabled with a good tool, go and find really good, good algorithms to work with. Yes. Yes, yeah, so this, this is basically an intelligence system that you have built and others are, you know, have built and they are, you know, working on that. So how does this intelligence system that is built on machine learning platform perform better if we talk about just credit scoring than the human system? Can you explain its underlying technology and algorithm fundamentals that helps to, you know, this uh, intelligence system to perform better? So what we generally say is that James does the equivalent of hiring a team of PhDs. And I know that you are a PhD, so I'm going to be very careful now. Uh, but effectively, the advice that an expert would give uh, a risk officer, and a risk officer generally has a background in mathematics or in finance, not a background in computer science and machine learning. So if there were an expert in machine learning sitting next to that person, that expert would be saying, oh, uh, you're... Um, your training set and your test set are slightly different on this property. Therefore, let's try and adjust this parameter of this particular algorithm in this way so as to decrease property X, Y, and Z. And that's what effectively James is doing. It's guiding the risk officer to, through the complicated decisions within building the machine learning algorithms. At the end of the day, yeah, the risk officer, him or herself, is the person who built it but they have been able to build something that would take a team of 50 PhDs in a year uh, traditionally to be able to build. And one of the things that we're quite proud of is of the, of the number of banks that we're working with and working with quite a few, the time to results has been really, really fast. So you know, generally we ask the banks up front, how long did it take you to get to your best ever model? And they might say, well, we've been using SaaS Enterprise Miner and we use this particular uh, model that we built over the years on this port for this portfolio, maybe it took two, three years to get to here. Okay, cool. Let's see if we give you this technology, how well you yourself with the same data can, can improve on that. And they're gen generally able to improve on that in under 24 hours. So there's this moment of slight shock of, okay, so it was the technology that was holding me, the risk officer, back. I see. You know, that, that's really interesting. So how widely accepted are these credit scoring intelligent machines? 
are all businesses uh, across nations are they interested in you know going in this direction and uh, using the technology that is available so that they can do better and perform better um, yes because it is essentially an existential crisis at this point if you're as a lender are, are left behind, then you know that your competitors will all be taking up this kind of technology and you will just be left with what no one, no one else wants. So effectively, there is a generalized arms race, you know, not only obviously with our technology, but with these sorts of technologies, there's effectively an arms race of adoption on the side of the banks. When I say banks, I also mean credit unions, online lenders, etc. Because if you're left behind in this technology race, then you know, you're in real trouble. Yes, yes, definitely. But see, this uh, I see there is some challenge for this kind of technology, this kind of intelligent machines, especially in the credit scoring area for the financial industry to uh, reach the widespread global market. Because see, Europe and you know United States, these are the countries we are heavily focused on the credit economy. We look at the credit scores and. Uh, uh, to base the uh, assessment and decision about whether to give a loan or not to give a loan. But countries, uh, there are a lot of emerging economies like, you know, in Africa or, you know, in Asia that are not credit-based economies. So how are they evaluating? How would you change your product or how would you change your approach so that these kind of uh, ma intelligent machines could be useful to nations like uh, India, China, you know, I, I'm not sure how China is doing it, but India and, you know, a lot of countries in Middle East as well as Africa. So the challenge that most emerging markets have is actually on the data quality side on, and on the amount of data that they have and the veracity of it. We've been exploring a few, uh, even though we're mostly focused on US and Europe for now, we're exploring quite a few opportunities in emerging markets. And one thing that we found was that you need to start on different sources of data first. You need to figure out, okay, what is a good proxy for, uh, for a non-performing loan? What kind of histories do we really have? How can we trust these histories? And the challenge starts a bit further upstream, but when, once you've solved that, and once you've developed good proxies and good, uh, pretty much good starting models and start collecting real data, it then becomes the exact same series of practices because when you have an intelligence uh, like James, the choice of algorithm might go to something simpler. You might want to use something closer to a logistic regression with a bit more bias and a bit less variant than say a random forest, et cetera. But if you're using a tool like James, you'll eventually end up with the best model for that type of data. And it's funny that then there are certain cases where you essentially need to figure out who are the best, uh, the best targets for your loans when you're still starting maybe your lending business. Uh, quite famously in microfinance, uh, the data showed that historically that it was better to lend to, to women than to men, uh, just on a statistical basis that it produced a, a better likelihood of the loan being repaid. And lots of uh, lenders are doing these kind of experiments of, okay, let's, let's lend a bit to try and learn about the environment. Let's figure out what are the kind of businesses that are, that are more likely to repay, let's figure out what are the, pro the proxies for it. Quite interestingly, because you can use nonlinear models now with technologies such as James, you also are able to allow the data to speak for itself and to get rid of some biases. I think the most fascinating story we ever found was when James for the first time ran into the concept of too good to be true which was when um, effectively a risk officer was building a couple of uh, ratios between, I think effectively it ended up at um, your debt to income ratio. And they were trying to figure out which businesses were really good to lend. And you know, James was saying, these businesses that have a huge amount of income compared to the amount that they're asking to lend, they're actually quite dangerous. And you know, that's completely counterintuitive. So why the hell would that be? And then they went and looked into their history and effectively the, those subsets of, uh, of lenders were just probably lying because they one didn't need a loan and then historically just looking at the data without any bias, the default rates were quite high. So you, you're able to then end up teaching an intelligence the concept of too good to be true. Yeah. which is kind of fun. Yes, of course. No, that, and talking, that, that's a very good example you gave. And talking about trust, at this point, can you say with confidence that this machine learning over human analysis 
for identifying credit scoring vulnerabilities are trusted by all these human decision makers, the risk officers that are uh, dealing with the this uh, platforms like James? I, I want to actually make the inverse case. I would say that they should not be trusted. They should be understood. Because a, a risk officer has the mathematical background to go and you know understand what's behind the curtain, and obviously these technologies make it quite tempting to just use something out of the box. But the reality is that it is better when using a technology like James to then go and figure out exactly why a certain decision was taken. That's a lot of the technology we ended up building into the tool was James interacting with the risk officer, explaining its thought process. And that's useful in a number of ways. I'll actually give another example of that, where machines are vulnerable and where they need humans. Uh, there's a, there was a bank that we were working with where they had a policy, which is relatively common, of not lending to people who are unemployed. However, every once in a while, someone would come along and would say, you know, I'm technically unemployed, but uh, I've had a, a really high paying job for 10 years. I'm just taking one year off because I'm uh, I'm taking care of my kid, and now I, I obviously can get another job because I've got this background. And, you know, I'm really safe. And the risk officer would say, yeah, yeah, sure, objectively, this looks safe, would override, and the person would not default, and it would be safe. And this kept happening over the years, to the point that they had a data set where all the people who were unemployed were extremely safe. Now, you just feed that to a machine blindly, and the machine will learn, well, there's nothing better in the world than to be unemployed. That's the safest thing in the world. And that's where a risk officer needs to look at it and say, well, I see what you're thinking, but you're wrong because actually there's a huge bias in the data. Let's override that. And so the interaction between human and machine is absolutely critical. And that's why I think that the way in which we designed it, whereby the machine interacts with a human during the process, rather than just assuming that machines blindly can do a better thing, is just a better approach. Yes, it takes the emotion factor out of it, right? I mean, it lets you think based on the pure data and uh, gives you a whole different kind of viewpoint. So that's a good example. That's a good point you made. So what do you think is the impact of machine learning to credit scoring and risk from your perspective? As you see, uh, you are also uh, see, doing probably consulting your organization with all these financial uh, industry businesses. So where do you see it making a big impact? Mm -hmm. It's a gigantic impact, actually, the potential. This is one of the things that I find interesting about companies that are trying to fight non-performing loans, is that the size of the problem is so dramatic. Uh, you know, there are approximately $2 trillion of non-performing loans between Europe and the US. There's 20% of the GDP of Italy is stuck in non-performing loans. You've got a huge percentage of the American population is going at some point during their lives to be chased by debt collectors. It's a gigantic problem. And the impact that can have, it's not only in avoiding the downside of you know, ruining lives and ruining economies, but also in opening up a huge new potential for economic growth. If you are able to lend more safely, then you can help businesses to grow. You can help unemployment to go down. The amount of impact that this sort of technology can have is just gigantic. And that's one of the things that we actually hire people who are passionate about this particular problem because we know that at the end of the day we are solving one of finance's top problems and that it it does impact people in the end yes very very well uh, very true very you made a very very important point and it seems that without the help of machine learning system uh, we probably are not at a point where the credit risk analyst can resolve the credit issues in a short time frame uh, is that accurate that, you know, we will not be able to gather the data or intelligence or understanding about the issues in the credit uh, landing, you know, industry or uh, overall the markets that, as you said, in a timely manner? So there is a combination of two things. I would say that the problem that is being addressed here has two components. One of them is technological, and that is by making sure that the credit risk systems are able to make better prediction. The other one is political, and I mean political in the vaster sense of the word. So you can have really good predictions, but then depending on what you do with them, uh, you'll get a completely different result. Or if you have a policy which is irresponsible, the fact that, you're, that your risk department is giving you a better indication of why it is irresponsible won't change much. So I would say that at the end of the day, the two things need to be tackled. 
One of them is the responsibility of society, of regulators, of governments. And the other part is up to technology and to companies like ours, but also up to the risk officers themselves who are doing a spectacular job and making everything safer. Um, if these two sides play at the same time, I do genuinely think that this is a little problem. Yes, absolutely. This is, these are all interconnected, interdependent mm -hmm. risks. So even if you know using the uh, technology platform like James, if we are able to identify those risks, there are, I mean, this is one risk area, but there are so many different risks that have so many interconnectedness and interdependencies. And if we don't work together, to manage those risks, then you know we are not going anywhere. Even if we have such you know amazing intelligent systems that are telling us what needs to be done, what needs to uh, how the kind of understanding that it provides us, and that's the reason we came up with this NGIOA approach to say that you know any nation it has this you know components, government, industries, organizations, and academia, and they all play an important role, and they all need to work collectively to manage this big you know, risk that we are all facing because of the in rising complex interconnectedness and interdependencies that is coming over because of the digital global age. And that is the whole reason we have started this you know, uh, risk roundup also to provide that understanding, to raise that awareness and to give that education to everyone so that they understand the complex challenges that we are facing. Now, coming back to your point about this credit, uh, the intelligence systems that you have built, the James platform, how many businesses are actively using machine learning application for credit scoring? So, um, through, well, I do not know the full spectrum throughout Europe and the US. I know that most of the top tiers have a program for adoption of uh, machine learning technologies directly through us. It's currently 12, uh, but we're actually quite a, expanding quite fast to, because we started obviously working with larger banks and now we're trying to also reach the smaller lending institutions. If you get an idea, there's, there are probably 16,000 lenders between Europe and US. So just in that space, there's a huge number of lenders that, that we can help. Yes. Um, but of those, the, the percentage that is actively using uh, machine learning is still definitely way under the 1% mark. And I think that will become in the 90% the in the next few years if this will be something that will change the industry upside down. Obviously not only us, we, we hope to play a big part in that, but the technological change, the, the pressures that are coming from the higher competition, the pressures that are coming from regulation, the pressures that are coming from the actual way in which business is done in this field will definitely make machine learning a key part of credit. There's, I, I don't think anyone in the field will disagree with that. Yes, yes, very true. Now, I mean, in spite of all these, uh, you know, the great advances and, you know, the great adoption and businesses are buying in, that they're seeing the need for this kind of platforms. As you said before, that in spite of all that, there is still the need for the human component playing an important role. They still need to be at the heart of the credit scoring system uh, and to go through the results of the machine learning analysis and ultimately identifying and handling those kind kind of you know complex risk incidents that they come across. So, do you see that the second level or the you know in, as we advance in the developing more intelligent systems, that the role of human component, component will still play an important role? Yes, I, I think that the, there is a part of human action that will become less important, which is the repetitive uh, task. So for example, if, you're, if your work is to tune a machine learning algorithm and the only thing that you know is how to find the best hyperparameters and parameters for something, well, then that's the kind of work that a machine can definitely do and will do better and faster. But if the work is to make sure that the bank has a policy that makes sense to set the rules for, for then an intelligence to, to do, so then you're, you're in a critical position uh, and a position that is absolutely necessary. And I think that's the big division. It's between manual labor and intellectual labor. Humans are absolutely critical for setting the rules, creating what needs to be done and then setting up the problem. Machines are better than at solving the problem when, they, when it's a well-posed, well-defined numerical issue. And I feel that with the risk offices that we see, there are generally lots of very intelligent people who are wasting lots of their time in Excel, just you know, typing in numbers, stuff that 
should be automated so that they can be free to do the creative, more important part of their work, which is to set better rules, to create better methodologies, to actually go and do the fundamental stuff that they can do and no one else can. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, let me bring out the little visionary in you. How do you see the next generation credit scoring solution? Where do you see this going? What kind of solutions you will develop? I mean, think about it as a visionary that this is how, you know, the credit so scoring solutions will look like in five years or 10 years. So I think the, um, the key, there are a couple of key components which I think are interesting and will definitely happen. One of them is this idea that a bank produces a model that then is reported to a regulator and may be approved and that there's a lot of requests for authorizations in every direction. I think the whole thing will look a lot more integrated and the rules will be clearer. If you are able to comply with these rules, then you can build your, you can have the system that you want. And I think that it will become therefore much more data driven. So as the data comes in about my, my defaults, my beha the behavior of my clients, the way that things have been going, the systems can dynamically adapt. So the, the bank effectively becomes a lot more artificially intelligent. I know it's a, it's a bit of a buzzword, but it's effectively what it is. A bank will become an artificially intelligent structure with some exceptionally intelligent human beings inside telling the AI what to do. And I, I honestly think that that is the direction in which credit is going and that all the lenders that don't go in that direction in five years will just seem slightly absurd and old fashioned. Right, right. I know that's a good point. Uh, keep it up. Up today in 2016 saying, oh, we don't really use computers, we have paper. I think in five years, if someone says, oh, we don't really use AI, that, that will be the reaction. Very good, very good. You know, that, that's a very good point that you made there. So irrespective of individual businesses, do we apply the same approach of machine learning to find solutions for all credit scoring problems or they're, they're all customized? So there are a couple of exceptions where um, machine learning doesn't currently go, where there's, by the definition of the problem, not enough data. So if you take cor huge corporate loans, if I'm making a loan to IBM, uh, you know, I might be a huge bank making a loan to IBM. There's no history of what those transactions are. That's really a one-off. That's where effectively our ability as humans to develop intuitions on very small amounts of data of having conversations with the, with the project manager at IBM who's going to be responsible for that project to see if they structure the team in a way that makes sense for that particular application. Now, this is an area where I think humans will, it would be very complicated to replace them because we're incredibly good with small amounts of data. And as we've seen, you know, even on any benchmark, when there are small amounts of data, humans are able to somehow develop intuitions which are extremely accurate without needing a lot of examples. On the other side, in situations where there is enough of a data set and, you know, SME loans, consumer loans, anything that is, even mortgages for that matter, when there is a considerable amount of history, there, I think we will end up in a situation where machines will be the first, uh, will be kind of ahead of the curve and where humans will be commanding the machines rather than making the decisions directly because it's just not a good use of their time. Yes, yes, yes. So it seems. Now, apart from credit scoring, what are some, some of the other intelligent machines uh, for the financial community that we should be expecting in the coming years? Well, there are a couple of them that are expected and already visible. One of them for the insurance space, the whole idea that we have now of insurance is a very paperwork intensive thing is a bit absurd in its own self. And I think insurance will start being treated as upside down credit pretty much. So the same methodologies kind of apply if you just turn the whole thing upside down and think of it as credit that you give first and that you take first and pay, pay later. Uh, those will start to be applied in the insurance space. Uh, I'm pretty sure that a number of other areas, such as your ability deciding on what kind of clients you want, so the whole you know, your customer space will learn much more from uh, from machine learning. A fraud detection is obviously one that's already getting relatively commoditized. So everyone now, anyone who's not using machine learning for fraud detection, is really behind the curve at this point. So I think all of these areas, which are already data driven, but data driven by humans will just become more and more machine learning intensive. Yes, yes. Now it's reported that machine learning, it allows analysts 
or risk officers to use math and algorithms to detect attacks and risky behaviors that have bypassed traditional detection systems without relying on rules, signatures, or blacklists. Now, cyber, you, these are also, you know, softwares that are, or I would say intelligent systems that are based in cyberspace. And, you know, it, it is digitalized and it's connected to the open internet. So are these also vulnerable to the same cybersecurity uh, challenges that uh, everyone else is going through? And uh, how are they managing that? If that is the you know case, what kind of uh, precautions or defensive mechanism do you have to have that is inbuilt so that it prevents that kind of cybersecurity, you know, attacks? So there are a couple of things that are that are old school for a reason, and one of them is your systems that are giving out loans generally will always take a little longer to, for example, adopt pure cloud models. So one of the things that we created with James was this hybrid model where part of it is, part of it is on prem exactly because you know, this is something that helps you to decide whether you should be giving out loans or not. It should be on a premises that is well defended, that is well controlled, etc. I do find that it is not going to be the primary, generally machine learning systems of this nature are not going to be primary sources of attack for the simple reason that there will be so much low hanging fruit in the near future, I fear, that these will kind of be the best defended areas and the hardest ones to crack. If we go into the cyber security space, there's a recently I heard a very interesting uh, conference on cyber security where a guy was mentioning, why the hell would I go and hack cars? That's so difficult. I might as well just hack everyone's air conditioning and knock down the power grid. So the problems that we will have with the cyber security will come down from the weird areas where we're not even think about them, thinking about them. Uh, not necessarily on these big obvious targets, but unfortunately, I think we will need to take cybersecurity seriously on every single thing that we have and bit that we do. And I think the air conditioners are a good reminder of things that are going to be vulnerable to cybersecurity attacks and that we're not in any way thinking of the security of them. Whereas stuff in finance, security is one of the first concerns immediately. So I think they will end up not being as vulnerable. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, there you will have to you know address the application security that would need to be embedded part of that. And yes, cybersecurity it impacts everyone and everything. So with Internet of Things and with you know everyone going uh, the uh, online and everyone having smartphones and smart applications, everyone is vulnerable. You're absolutely right. So now let's go to another point: credit scoring, data science, and machine learning. Is all the data valued equally? Um, well, the answer is yes and no, obviously. The, at, all data is useful, in this, even if it is only for a machine to then realize that it is not useful. Uh, we've generally uh, designed a number of uh, parts of James to help risk officers tell where there is signal and where there is just noise. One of the phenomena that's happening in the industry, unfortunately, is that there's, because it's a new industry, there's lots of suppliers of data that come to banks and to lenders to say, oh, we have this magic source of data which costs you $200,000 a month. And when we run that through some tests, it's actually pretty much very close to noise or very, uh, or highly linearly dependent on stuff that we already knew. And so I think part of it has been, yes, you should be able to analyze all data, but you should always be very quick to tell which data is useful and which data is not. I find a big parallel between, I, I used to do a few things for, for hedge funds and the, the parallel is, is huge between the amount of noise that's out there of, well, maybe there's some signal uh, in this particular type of data source that's coming from X. Well, be quite skeptical about what state, what signal and what is noise, but definitely allow the signal, the, the signal or noise to come in and be tested. I would put it that way. Yes, yes, no, absolutely. That's a fair point. Now, it is reported that financial institutions have long used artificial neural network systems to detect many kinds of changes or claims, uh, anything happening outside of the norm. And they would you know, flag these for human investigation or analysis for their analysts to look over. Can you share what functions, roles, and processes of financial institutions are now performed by intelligent machines? So I think the, the partnership between humans and machines is very, is very much explored with these questions. So for example, if you take uh, 
fraud detection, that's a very famous one because a, unlike with loan defaults, fraud has a lot of creativity, right? So if, uh, if I'm built, doing some sort of credit card fraud where I'm going from one city to another um, and I'm using a credit card to buy televisions or something, that's a bit too obvious. There'll be a history of that and it will be caught quite easily by a machine just looking at data. But if I'm extremely creative, if I create some sort of weird triangle where I buy a Bitcoin and then I change it for something and then I go somewhere else and then I launder the money in a new way, that's something only a human can look at and say, mm, this feels wrong, it's just weird, why would he do that, doesn't make any sense. Even though I've never seen this before, I, I can immediately know that that is wrong. And so for the cases where there is a history, machines are the best. Uh, they're also okay in telling that something is unusual, but they're not capable of saying it's unusual, therefore it's, it's wrong. At that stage, they need a human to call, to call and say, please, this is unusual, I don't know what to do, help me human, you're better with small amounts of data. Yes, yes, very true, very true. Now, there are some who say that there is more value in using multi-stage machine learning analysis and actual data to determine which machine learning model will work best. Credit score, I mean, uh, to do, let's say, you know, credit scoring events or any, uh, on any network. Why is that so? Why is multiple model processing data or multi-stage multi machine learning analysis uh, why does that provide more value? Can you explain that? Well, it's the same way that we think, really. So, um, to use an example from um, from linguistics, if um, if I am saying a, a particular sentence and I use some word which is slightly ambiguous, ambi uh, ambiguous. Let's say that I, I say the word um, "read," and I can now say, "Well, I, I read a book," or uh, "or I, the book was read." you have a bit more of a layer because you can tell that, okay, in that context it has to be an adjective because it followed a noun. In that other context, it came after a noun, therefore it must be a verb or it's more likely to be a verb. So having uh, multiple layers of uh, context helps and that's why neural networks are way better generally predicting stuff with enough data to train on than really simple models. And also, just addressing the, the simpler point of making ensembles of different algorithms, that's just if a particular algorithm is better at the majority of cases, but then for the edge cases, there's an algorithm which is really good on getting to those edge cases, but quite terrible in the generality, an ensemble of both might have the best of both roles if it is trained correctly. And I would add that one last point, which is in the middle of all this, which algorithm works best still requires a human to come up with what best means. Yes, we have to define. You're absolutely right. That uh, definition is up for humans and, you know, that will they will be able to take it forward. Now, there is a growing belief that the future will see neural networks trained in one data set become the input to others, thereby creating deep networks by extending the knowledge of high-level networks. What impact will this, this have on industry applications? So I would say that in finance, it will not be the. I would say the finance will not be the first one to be very much impacted by this. Um, not because there won't be a lot of attempts. I'm sure that on the hedge fund side, there will be a lot more of use of this sort of technology. In lending, realistically, there is not that much data. We have a single institution might have a few millions of loans at best, maybe tens of millions. But generally, there will not be those incredibly complex data sets that allow you to train huge uh, algorithms. If you have data, as most banks have, in the hundreds of thousands or even worse, in tens of thousands, you're probably better off with a slightly simpler algorithm, which is more robust and that you understand better, than with something which is extremely, um, that is extremely uh, well, complicated and may be powerful hypothetically. On the other hand, if you're talking about analyzing fraud uh, or anything that has a lot of transactions and a lot of history and where you know the behavior of that card by the second over the last few years and now you have a new observation, you have all of the cards by the second over all the years, that's where you have enough data to go into some crazy advanced algorithm. It's really dependent on what type of application there is and I, I feel there's also a bit of a temptation to go into the slightly sexier side of deep learning and algorithm on applications that don't necessarily need it. 
Uh, we're trying to resist the temptation, even though it's obviously, as engineers, it's also always the temptation of going for the most powerful algorithm. Sometimes the most explainable one is more important than the most powerful one. Yes, yes, that's, that's a fair point. Now, it is being reported that there are serious efforts going on to bridge the gap of unstructured data by taking advantage of the natural language processing capabilities on AI platforms, artificial intelligence platforms. What is the current state of capabilities to sift through these you know, large amounts of unstructured data that is out there? So there's an, an interesting use case, which is really basic. It doesn't require uh, any advanced uh, machine learning algorithm or anything like that. It is a data set that was actually published online for a while. I don't know if it's still there which is Lending Club's uh, public data sets. So they had their data sets of who defaulted and who did not on Lending Club. And they had most of the things relatively well structured, just how, what was the age of the person, how much was the loan, what was the interest, etc. And a bit of text, which I always found the most fascinating bit, was uh, the description, the stuff that people had written freehand into it. So some people had just written, I really need a loan. Or someone might have written, I need a loan because I'm getting married and I want to go on a honeymoon to the Philippines. And this bit clearly had some signal. You could look at it and you could say, okay, someone is saying, I need a loan because I crashed my father's car and I'm in trouble. Okay, this is a really high risk loan, but not obviously, you can't really obviously tell how. And by running some relatively basic, and I mean proper basic natural language processing on that, you can extract a ton of signal. So this is a really basic case. Now, expand that to a bank that has a full history on everything that every interaction that the person's had with it. The amount of signal that's just out there in non-obvious forms is tremendous. And I think that that's a very interesting angle of just getting better data by intelligently figuring out where there is signal and picking it up. And I think that's also where a lot of improvements are going to come from. Yes, yes, very true, very true. Now, it seems that there are many different approaches to collect information from unstructured data. Are they all effective? Um, well, obviously the, the answer is, is no. There are a few that are better suited for different applications. And it's unfortunately a boring answer that generally speaking, the answer is always it depends on the application. It depends on the for, for you, have many to try. you have to try it out and see which one works better, right? Yes, there's, there's, at that point, that's where you really need the data scientists to look at it and say, okay, for this particular type of problem, I've tried a number of things before. I know that this is the kind of thing that works best. I'm pretty sure that at some point, our intelligences will start to develop kind of the meta understanding of what kind of approach to even try. At this stage, it does still require the data scientists to look at it and get a strong intuition of things. Yes, yes, very true. So now it seems that it is possible to have big data and machine learning technology to analyze large quantities of data, find the unusual activity, correlate it with, you know, many other unusual activities uh, within and across the boundaries of your initiative and notify human analyst of the problem immediately when as soon as it occurs. And uh, what needs to be done to solve it instantly, all this, you know, is possible because of the advances that are available in technology. So uh, from your perspective, when you develop this Jane's model, what specific advances made it possible so that you could develop that? That's actually a very good question. It would have been absolutely impossible to do this for us two years ago on sheer cost of CPU. I mean, James is a relatively expensive beast in terms of how much CPU it consumes, but it's probably less than a tenth than the price of CPU that it would have had a few years, a couple of years ago, because of cost of infrastructure directly and also, also the optimizations that have been done on the algorithms themselves. And on top of that, there's the, the usability. I can now write up and use an algorithm in a week that before without all the libraries and all of the open source developments that have been done would have taken me two or three years. And the speed of acceleration to which you can do research and you can improve things has just become absurd. So we're right at the sweet spot, I would say, of when, when things can be done. And we find it still, in our day-to-day -day activities, we kind of feel the, the wind in our back of how things have been changing. If you, about the end of last year, there were a group of guys at CERN that wrote a piece of technology that was 
used for searching for the Higgs boson because they had really large spaces to search through, uh, hyperparameter spaces, and they wanted to be able to go down that hyperparameter space as fast as they possibly could in a, and it's a non-convex space, it's a horrible mathematical problem. Normally it would take, you know, a huge amount of work to be able to do something like that. And they started writing something that could potentially solve that. And the open source community just latched onto it, including us, and started adding ideas to it and figuring out how it could be done. And now that whole gigantic problem is two lines of code. So the, the difference between worlds in just six months is absurd. And now games are using a piece of technology that was started at CERN. This could only happen in 2016. Right, right, right. Well, that, that's uh, very interesting, very interesting. Now, across NGO, that means nations, it's government, industries, organizations, and academia, large amounts of data is being generated and transferred due to rapidly growing digitalization and globalization, digital global age. So it's getting difficult for human intelligence to monitor industry threats with the you know traditional tools that have been used over the years and this is probably one of the reasons why potential industry risks go unnoticed because there is no ability to you know identify them in a proper manner in a timely manner do you think the solution to identifying all industry risk might be in machine learning um i'm going to deliberately be slightly con uh, contradictory to the answer that one would expect from a machine learning uh, expert. I think that we are in, uh, at the risk of overtrusting it. Machine learning technology isn't at the point where we can just offload the responsibility of uh, monitoring things. At the end of the day, the responsibility for monitoring things is ours. The actual processes by which they are monitored, defined by humans, the actions can then be done by machines. But I fear sometimes that we will develop these first prototypes in AI that can go and look for systematic risk or that can go and try and predict, I don't know, earthquakes or something. We will then get overconfident of our abilities and then it will all fail spectacularly and we'll be very surprised as to why. And I think that a significant degree of maybe even academic skepticism as to the, the power of machines to monitor things that we cannot monitor ourselves uh, is, is necessary. And that's what, one of the reasons why once when we were building James, we built it to interact with humans. And at the end of the day, to make sure that the human had the last say. And the reason is it is excessively easy to trust a machine with something that at the end of the day is our responsibility because it seems very powerful and it then might miss something that as a human we would just look at that and say, oh, wait, what do you mean that the housing prices are going to continue go up, going up at this speed? Yes, there's a history of that, but I'm, I'm not an idiot, I'm a human, I know that that will not work. And the machine will not spot that. Yes, yes. Machine will have the data and understanding that we humans have provided that, right? I mean, at least at this point. We don't know yes. after 15, 20 years, you know, what kind of uh, machines would be there because of the advances in the artificial, you know, right now we are from ANI, that is artificial narrow intelligence to artificial general intelligence. There are, you know, questionable, uh, there is a viewpoint that some say that we have already reached there. Some says we haven't reached there yet. And then we are all working towards ASI, artificial super intelligence. So when we reach there, scenarios will be very different technology that we will artificial intelligence based technology will be entirely very different at that point probably you know humans will be relevant so we will have to wait and see you know how this goes but if you have the power to influence making artificial intelligence work for everyone across nations everyone uh, when i say everyone it means all individuals and all entities across nations it's government industries organizations and academia where would you like to see the development happening? Um, I would say once our ethics have caught up. <laughs> because if there's one thing that's slightly concerning about uh, true artificial intelligence, it's a bit like nuclear power. You know, it's a spectacularly powerful technology. And when we got nuclear power, the first thing we did was kill ourselves a bit. And I fear that with artificial intelligence, you know, 
we kind of need uh, what people like Stephen Hawking are, are, are talking about and to make sure that we develop, we get ready for it because the technology is only going to help us if we structure our own lives in a way that makes sense to, to use that. Um, expecting that we can just continue to randomly assign certain decisions to, to machines and hope that the outcomes will be fine, I find that excessively irresponsible. And I, I do think that people who are in the machine learning space and in the artificial intelligence space, a really high level of ethical responsibility in making sure that those technologies are used correctly. And hopefully that will be the case and we will end up with much better, uh, with a much better result and a much better uh, environment as a result of the emergence of those technologies. But for example, we had a talk recently here, actually, we, we, co we helped to organize that, well, us as, at a personal level with a few friends, where we had Joshua Bengio, who's uh, one of the experts in, uh, in deep learning, and one of the things he was talking about, you know, do this, do that, and at some point, please don't use any of the stuff that you're learning for, uh, for building military equipment or anything like that, because we're talking about something that can absolutely change the world for the better. The temptation of letting our old ways take the best of us might fall, might ruin the whole thing for everyone. Yes, yes, very true, very true. Uh, so now, uh, for our benefit of our global viewers and listeners, would you like to tell them, uh, give them, some, share some information about your James platform for their understanding? So and. Uh, if they are interested, where would they go and uh, find more information? So the easiest way to find out about uh, James is going to uh, james.finance, which is our, our website. Um, and the best way to see if it's uh, something that's interesting to your organization is actually to book a benchmark. One of the interesting things of having this set up in this way is that rather than spending three or four months trying to figure out if machine learning can help you, you can actually find that out in another 24 hours. and. That's something that's definitely worth discovering. Thank you, Pedro, for participating in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on machine learning for credit scoring, and our global viewers and listeners will benefit tremendously from the understanding you provided on the application of intelligent machines across financial industry and the opportunities and risk associated with the advances in technology and non-human intelligence. So even if a single individual or entity is able to come up with ideas, to advance machine learning, innovate to develop intelligent systems for the complex challenges facing nations and manage its associated security risk based on the understanding they received from this discussion we had today. This Risk Roundup Dialogue has been of service, and we thank you for that, Pedro. Thank you for having us. Wonderful, Pedro. So as the evolving story of machine intelligence and intelligence computing brings advanced algorithms machine learning, deep learning, and cognitive computing to solve problems typically performed by the humans. The concerns that in the coming years, human intelligence systems will not be able to solve complex problems surrounding them in cyberspace, geospace, and space on its own is getting very real. Risk Group Cybersecurity Risk Research Center and Strategic Security Risk Research Center are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIOA in CGS, that means nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace, they walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. It is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security, so if you build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security, and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risks together. For more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup videos, or hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com. And do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashik Mandya, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.